All rise and come to order. This court is now in session. The Honorable John S. Tiger presiding. You may be seated. Calling civil case 18-6810, East Bay Sanctuary Covenant et al. versus President of U.S. Donald J. Trump et al. Council, will you please approach and make your appearances. Good morning, Your Honor. Lee Gallant from the American Civil Liberties Union for Plaintiffs. Good morning, Your Honor. Scott Stewart on behalf of the Department of Justice. Uh, for the president and the other defendants, I'm joined by my colleague, Francesca Genova. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, and good morning also to other counsel whose appearances have been noted for the record. Uh, also, it looks like we have a few more people in the gallery than we normally do. Uh, welcome to you also. This is a public proceeding. <coughs> Let me deal with a few administrative matters before we get going. I'm going to set time limits on argument of 45 minutes per side. That time includes time spent answering questions from the court. There may be substantial questions from the court. First, the plaintiffs will argue, and then the defendants, and then the court will take a 15-minute recess. Then the plaintiffs will make a rebuttal argument if they want to do that, and they have time left. And the defendants will make a rebuttal argument if they want to do that, and they have time left. At that time, unless I order otherwise, I will then take the motion under submission. There is no need to reserve time or to ask Mr. Noble to reserve time. The amount of time you don't take during your initial argument is the time you will have for rebuttal. He will be keeping track of your time. For the administrative convenience of the court, the amicus brief of the state amici at docket number 34 is now deemed filed. I asked them to file it separately, and for whatever reason, they didn't. So we're just going to dispense with that. Uh, do counsel have anything for the court's attention before we proceed this morning? All right, very good. Mr. Gellert, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Congress has made explicit in the Immigration and Nationality Act that an individual may apply for asylum, quote unquote, whether or not they crossed at a port of entry. <clears throat> in 1990, that was 1980 when they adopted the Refugee Act. 1997, they again made explicit that it did not matter where you entered, you could apply for asylum. So what we have here, I believe, Your Honor, is not only a case that dealing with an enormous potential humanitarian crisis, but a classic separation of powers case. The administration is trying to override what Congress has done. Congress has made a very explicit decision to say it doesn't matter where you enter. And the reason I think is straightforward. It's not to condone people entering between ports of entry. Congress has put in criminal penalties for that. They've also put in civil penalties. But what Congress recognized and what international law recognizes and what all experts in this area recognize, including our declarants, is that there will be times when people enter between ports of entry. But entering between a port of entry has no bearing on how much danger you may be in. And so what our declarations show is that there are times when people enter between ports of entry where they just simply couldn't help it. Right now, they're being pushed back from ports of entry by the Mexican government. They're not even allowed to be put on lists. There are young children in Mexico who are begging to be put on the list at a port of entry who are not allowed to. There are long lines. CBP is pushing people back. Sometimes they tell families, well, you can go to a different port that's 50 miles away. And contrary to the narrative that's been out there publicly, these are not all criminals, cartel members who are coming here. These are families. Yesterday, one of our counsel were out there, and little boys are trying to get their teddy bears. They're here without their parents trying to get in. This is a real humanitarian crisis, and Congress could not have been clearer. It cannot be that you could not apply for asylum simply because you entered between a port of entry. And so what the president is trying to do is simply override that. And I think in response to the government's suggestion that there's a crisis here, I think there's a legal and factual response to that. The legal response is what I've just said. Congress has made the decision. 
And contrary to the administration's claim that there is now an immediate crisis going on, this is a long-term issue that Congress has been dealing with. The government, by the government's own admission, there were less than 400,000 apprehensions at the border. If you look at 2000 to 2008, there were well over a million apprehensions in those years, those eight years. Congress has been well aware of this issue and has taken a variety of steps, but the one thing it's never done is say you can't apply for asylum. And that's just because of the fundamental special nature of asylum. Congress can do a lot. No one is here condoning people crossing between borders, but ultimately people will cross borders because they don't know where the ports are, because they're pushed back, because criminal elements push them in between ports, and Congress has said you have to be able to apply for asylum. The factual point I would make... Mr. Gunn, yes, there's a, a great deal of, of uh, information in the record that it's sort of diffuse about the number of people who have entered the United States along the southern border at various ports, at points in time, the number of people who have applied for asylum and so forth. Is there anything in this record from which I can determine the number of people in a recent period, a recent fixed period, such as the most recent fiscal year or some other definable period, who were granted asylum under the existing law, but who would have been denied asylum or denied asylum and deported under the new interim rule? Uh, Your Honor, I don't think there's anything that specific in the record. We certainly can try and supply it, but I think this is this is moving so quickly. Um, there, my co-counsel may ha have some specific n number, but I think well, perhaps I don't. I don't mean to. I'm I'm mindful of our time limitations, and there, obviously there will be an opportunity for rebuttal, and so uh, a member of your team could be looking for this. And right. We can I think move on to something else. I think, Your Honor, the answer may be twenty thousand. It was, six, it was 20,000 who applied and 6,000 who passed. So we may be talking about... A well, let's, let's do this. Let's postpone that question. Yes, Your Honor. when you answer it again, when you, when the next time you answer it, I'll be looking for a record site. Right. Your Honor, I apologize. Okay. So let's, well, let's, let's, let's... I have some additional questions. Are you challenging the validity of the proclamation standing alone or just the rule? Your Honor, th that's a very important question. And I think... What we believe is that the only thing we need to challenge is the regulation. We are not here challenging the proclamation suspension of entry. I mean, we have real doubts that that does anything because EWIs, by definition, entering without inspection are already barred. We are simply here challenging the regulation. We think it's enough to have an injunction on the regulation because that's what bars asylum. Got it. Okay. And then as long as, I, yeah. as long as I've thoroughly interrupted you anyway, <laughs> no, let no, me you're say... Right. And I apologize at, for not having that record point, site. No, no, no. Please, at some point this morning, uh, I'm going to need to find out what is the term of the relief the plaintiffs are seeking. Is this really a temporary restraining order? Or given the, the circumstances, is it really in the nature of a request for a preliminary injunction? And if it's a TRO, what further proceedings do the plaintiffs anticipate and on what timeline? I mean, as you know, the rules anticipate right. uh, uh, a schedule of follow-on proceedings, and I, I have, my instinct tells me that the parties are going to seek immediate appellate review and that uh, a preliminary injunction proceeding is not in anybody's near-term future. But you may tell me otherwise. We just have to straighten that out. Well, Your Honor, I, I think... One thing that the Ninth Circuit has said is that if it's a pure TRO, it may not be appealable. So I think we are looking for a TRO right now, but we would be prepared to move on whatever schedule you think is appropriate for preliminary injunction. So the TRO, as Your Honor knows, would last 14 days. It could be extended another 14. So we are prepared to be back here in 14 days or if you extend it any time between 14 and 28. But on the TRO, I think the reason we believe we need a TRO, a short-term TRO, is because the danger right now, every day, people are in real danger of the being... Question, the question yeah. before the court is not whether I would not issue a TRO because of nothing about my question either expresses a view on the merits of the TRO application or forecloses the possibility of the issuance of a TRO. Um, but I do wonder, what further proceedings does anybody contemplate? We don't even, no one has even hinted that there might be the production of an administrative record. I mean, I, I, 
reading the briefs, I, I think the parties have given me everything they want to give me. And if that's true, and I'll ask the government this question right. in a few minutes, obviously, what further proceedings do they anticipate? But I'm, I, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, mm, well, I, I, I think I've said what I need to no, say. No, that's, that's fair, Your Honor. Um, if there are going to be further proceedings, we believe we've obviously put in enough for either a TRO or a preliminary injunction, which I think is what Your Honor is getting at, and whether now you would want a, a guidance from the Ninth Circuit on going forward. If we were going to go forward, we certainly would want to see some type of record from the government on why the regulation was passed, because we don't think what's in the, the preamble to the rule was sufficient. We would certainly continue to give Your Honor more information because, as you know, there was no 30-day grace period for the rule to go into effect and no notice of comment. And so we've literally been scrambling 24-7 all over the country, and every day we're learning about individuals who are in serious danger. So I think if we did go forward, if Your Honor decided to bifurcate, have a TRO, and then have a PI, and neither side tried to take up the TRO, I think we would present that type of record evidence for you because I think people's lives are very much in danger. They're in danger on the Mexican side because they're stranded there, families, kids, for six weeks, seven weeks, and it's very dangerous over there. There are also individuals now we're finding who have gone through to this country, been apprehended, would normally apply for asylum, have very strong asylum claims, but are not allowed to be, are not being allowed to apply for asylum and are in imminent danger of being removed. Um, in terms of the record, I think, you know, as Your Honor has pointed out, there is not an administrative record. There's a fairly conclusory preamble to the regulation. And, and I would just want to make two points about the, that preamble. One is a sort of conceptual point. If Your Honor looks at that preamble, I think Your Honor will see that almost everything there goes to that the government doesn't, this administration doesn't believe that people are passing at high enough rates or, show, or passing at too high rates or showing up for their hearings, all those types of things. And what I think Your Honor will, will, will take from that is that really the beef the administration has is with how the asylum process works, not with ports of entry versus entry without inspection, which is really supposed to be the issue. How often people show up for their hearings, and we dispute that factually, and we have an affidavit from the Terira Declaration, the Terira Group, but that doesn't go to whether you apply at a port of entry or enter without inspection. That simply goes to the government's feeling that the asylum process is too easy for people. It's an asylum process, though, that Congress set up. Likewise, the time it takes to do the hearings, you have Mr. Rodriguez's declaration, who was the head of United States Citizenship and Immigration Service who is saying the same amount of time, takes the same amount of time to do a hearing at a port as between, and when someone enters at a port versus when they enter between ports. So most of what you see in there about the high asylum rate for people from the Northern Triangle really doesn't go to where they enter. It goes to the administration again feeling like the asylum process is not what they would want, but it's an asylum process Congress set up. When you what is the fit? between that point, which I think finds support in the record, and uh, the legal fit between that point and your complaint that the proclamation and the rule violate the INA or that there was an improper uh, failure to utilize a notice and comment period. How, does a one, how do I incorporate the one into the other? Yeah, Your Honor, I think that's exactly the, the right point because what we are saying is all those facts might suggest that Congress look at the asylum process again. I mean, Congress has looked at it a ton and said we're happy with the asylum process, but all of that goes to whether or not there should be asylum at a port of entry or entering without inspection. It's the government's burden to come forward and say the reason we're shutting down asylum for people between ports but not at ports is there's some government interest in that. And we cannot really find that in the preamble. Everything about the rates, the grant rates of asylum, goes to whether you, doesn't go to where you apply, it goes to whether you can apply anywhere. The only things the government is saying about why they want people to go to ports is, well, they would rather people go to the ports and it be an orderly process. We don't dispute that. That's fine, but the reason we dispute factually is, I mean, well, 
as I said, Your Honor, it's a legal and factual answer because legally Congress has made the decision and is well aware of this issue. So that's really dispositive. But factually, the government has not put in anything to suggest that this rule will eliminate people going between ports of entry. And I think that's what our declarations say, and there's really nothing in the record to contradict it, that there are very unsophisticated people often who simply don't know where the ports are. There are criminal gangs who, put, who pull people to, uh, sorry, between ports of entry, and they say you have to go here, and there's sometimes at gunpoint. Sometimes the kids are not allowed to be put on a list. What we've learned recently is that the Mexican government is not letting children at ports of entry apply unless they have a guardian or a parent to tell them to, to sign something. Well, if they're, if they're fleeing from their parents, they're obviously not going to have a parent there. So what the administration has said is we think putting out this rule and we think doing it right now will channel everyone to a port. It's simply not supported by the record. And to Your Honor's question, I think on the notice and comment is very important because what our plaintiffs would have said in a notice and comment is this is not going to work to channel everyone to a port of entry. And what they would have explained based on decades and decades of expert um, observations is just simply saying go to a port, you can't apply asylum, is not going to work. There are indigenous people coming from Central America who have no idea where the ports are. There are cartels telling people at gunpoint you must enter here or we're going to kidnap you, rape you. There are long lines, six weeks sometimes, little children sleeping in Mexico in dangerous areas. And so that would have all been said in a notice and comment. So I think that's really what's missing from the, the preamble and the regulation is any reason to believe that this kind of rule would channel everyone to a port. But again, this is something, Your Honor, that Congress has known for a long time. Again, 2000 to 2008, well over a million people were entering between ports. So the, the administration claiming that all of a sudden there's an emergency now, this is a long-term issue that Congress has been dealing with. And Congress has tried a variety of ways, and certainly everyone says you can channel people to ports if you want, but the one thing you cannot do is, is buy asylum. Where in the record could I easily find, and you can defer answering this to rebuttal too, the uh, reference to a million people entering between ports from 2000 to 2018? I'm just asking for a record citation. Oh, I'm sorry, the point Your Honor. you just made, either, either now or at some later time in your argument. Yes, Your Honor. We, I, I apologize again. I hope I don't have to apologize too many more times. You don't have to apologize at any time. <laughs> it's a big record. Yeah. I don't know where it is either. That's why I asked you, so that's fine. Um, but the, uh, Your Honor, it is an official United States Border Patrol, and I... And I, um, it, Your Honor, it's cited in the Isaacs, Isaacson Declaration. He has two declarations, one an original and one a supplemental. And it's the United States Border Patrol specific um, Southwest border sector um, numbers. And what it shows is in 2000, there were 1.6 million between the ports. 2001, 1.2 million. The next two years, over 900,000. The next two years, again, over, next three years, again, over a million. This year, the government has said there's under 400,000. And so I think the relevance for that, for the notice and comment, is this is not one of those emergency situations. I mean, the notice and comment is very important in a situation like this because it needs to take into account the views of people on the ground, like our plaintiffs. And what would have happened if there were notice and comment is we would have explained that the numbers were higher historically. We would have explained why this rule is not going to channel certain people to the ports. And so I think what, what the Ninth Circuit has said is you really need a strong showing for a good cause. And they have said it's very demanding. The court should really scrutinize it. I don't think the preamble's conclusory assertion that this rule will channel everyone to the ports and that it was truly an emergency is actually could, could, could come close to satisfying the Ninth Circuit standard. I mean, what the Ninth Circuit has said is that you, you have to make sure that it's truly an emergency. What we're talking about here, I know that there's been a lot of talk in the press about the caravan. 
But the truth is that when you actually look at the preamble, there's very little about the caravan, and there's a lot about annual statistics. And I think that's because ultimately the government recognized that the caravan is not a serious issue. And as the Isaacson Declaration and the Panera Declaration point out, caravans, most of the people usually end up dropping off. Our own military has put out that it's likely to be only 20 percent of the people come, and most of those people will come to the, the ports. Um, and caravans have been coming for years, as our de declarations have said. I, I think this narrative about the caravan has gotten out there, but the truth is it's something that happens all the time. Immigration is cyclical, and the numbers, as I said, are, have been way higher. So I think the need for putting in this rule immediately was not there. And the government has suggested, well, there were foreign affairs, but again, the courts have been clear that just because it's immigration doesn't mean it's foreign affairs. And if you look at the Jean V. Nelson case out of the 11th Circuit, that was about the Haitians, but they said the foreign affairs exception wasn't guaranteed. What, what, sorry, wasn't satisfied. If you, if you look at the cases the government is relying on, they are where there was serious emergency foreign affairs issues, the Iran hostage crisis. Um, the, the after 9-11. Those are the types of foreign affairs situations where the Congress has said we will excuse notice and comment, but not in a situation where ultimately what the government is saying is we don't like the patterns of migration that Congress has been aware of. So we don't believe there has actually been an emergency. Um, I would just say a few words before I sit down about standing, Your Honor. The first thing I would say is as, as Your Honor knows, courts regularly find organizational standing. And we believe that the, we have the declarations clearly show that there is going to be a diversion of resources and frustration of mission. The other thing I would say is at this point, since as Your Honor knows we're moving very quickly, the Ninth Circuit has said, like in, in, for example, in the case Valley de Sol, at this stage, a preliminary stage, you don't need to have a f the fullest possible record. You just need to have a basic showing. I think we have more than a basic showing about how all our organizations are going to have to divert resources. And that's both for our merits INA claim and for our notice and comment claim. And I know the government has also pushed a zone of interest type argument. The things I would say about that are it's a prudential doctrine. Obviously, at this stage, the court can just satisfy itself that there's enough here. And courts routinely find in situations like this that organizations are with the zone of interest. That's um, the AOL case by Judge Bashant in the Southern District of California. That's the Doe case by Judge Robart. It's also Hawaii v. Trump where the states are, um, where the state was suing under the INA and, and found to be within the zone of interest. I, I think ultimately the government's argument proves too much. If it had to be a non-citizen, then no organization would ever be able to sue. But, the organi but courts have routinely found that organizations can sue, and especially in a situation like this where things are moving so quickly and it's an enormous Can you, Give me again, yeah. please, the name of the Ninth Circuit case on uh, uh, lower... Uh, uh, Val Sh Valley de Sol, Your Honor. It's the, it was the challenge to um, the... Um, it was the 2013 Valley de Sol case. Valley oh, I have it now. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I just, thank you. Um, and, and then, and then if, uh, just before I sit down, on the APA notice and comment, I think the government is sort of half heartedly suggesting the organizations don't have a right to sue on that claim, the APA 553 notice and comment. Well, uh, you know, truthfully, in the immigration area, those are the only people who actually comment. I mean, the non-citizen, especially a non-citizen abroad, is not commenting on a regulation. So I think it would have to be the organization who's ultimately going to comment on that. So we think clearly they're standing, especially at this preliminary stage, Your Honor. So I would, if, unless the court has questions, I would reserve the rest of my time. Very good. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Geller. Mr. Stewart.
Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the Court. The rule and proclamation at issue in this case respond in a targeted and lawful way to a serious crisis facing our immigration system. That crisis is the crushing strain caused by large numbers of unlawful entries at our southern border that are followed by ultimately meritless assertions in the credible fear process. This misuse of our asylum system. What's the practical effect of the rule? What does the administration hope to accomplish in, in terms of the rule's practical effect? Uh, a few, a few things, Your Honor. One, one practical effect is to channel, as the rule explains, um, those who seek to enter the country to ports of entry where they can be processed in an orderly, uh, controlled, and sensible way uh, where they don't have to be uh, the subjects of at-large apprehensions that put themselves and uh, American law enforcement lives at risk. That's one. The other, Your Honor, is to um, facilitate negotiations with our international partner, Mexico, uh, in the effort to have Mexico, as well as the Northern Triangle countries, uh, contribute and help address the serious uh, issues caused by migrants transiting through Me Mexico, making a, a journey that has potential dangers. So it's, it's aimed also to facilitate um, an orderly and safe process to, to get that existing uh, set of problems resolved. So I want to I want to pick up on the point that you just made, which actually echoes something Mr. Gellert just said, and that is that the uh, regulation, the language of the regulation, um, uh, takes the, the view that uh, writ large, there are not enough meritorious asylum claims contained within the body of applicants. And that's essentially what you just said, and that is that we have too many people applying for asylum who are not uh, qualified. You and I can agree that some of the applicants are entitled to receive asylum, and they do receive asylum, correct? Correct, Your Honor. That happens. Is there anything about this rule that increases the percentage of meritorious applications? If that's the problem, what, if anything, does this rule do to solve that problem? Your Honor, it discourages people from crossing unlawfully uh, and essentially buying potentially years of release into the country because of the very low initial threshold by establishing a positive credible fear. Is you there know? any correlation between what you just said and the existence of credible fear or the other criteria that would qualify somebody for asylum. How are those things logically related to each other? You, it's true, the rule will discourage people from entering the country to make asylum claims. That seems clear. Everyone agrees on that. And it does that in some ways by making it more difficult to present such a claim. And, and, and there's a debate about whether it's appropriate to make it more difficult in the way the rule does that. That's why we're here this morning. But my question is, having done that, how does that make it more likely that the claims that are ultimately presented are meritorious? Because the people who are most likely to present their, to have legitimate asylum claims will then go to ports of entry, are more likely to go to ports of entry, or they will be beneficiaries of a potential solution with, with Mexico, with the Northern Triangles that addresses this uh, issue on a broader scale, Your Honor. Your Honor, I, I'd emphasize here that this is not on uh, a rule that targets just asylum seekers across the board. It's a, it's a focused measure at a particular problem of uh, folks who are largely from Northern Triangle countries who cross illegally between ports of entry and are able to stay in the country because they pass a federal, federal a fear screening, even though they ultimately, uh, by large numbers, don't show up for asylum hearings, don't apply for asylum at all, and when they do apply and do show up, uh, their claims are ruled to have no merit. And that why, large- Why is it that people with meritorious asylum claims are more likely to go to ports of entry than people whose claims are not meritorious? How does the one follow from the other? Because if, they, if they're rendered ineligible to get asylum, they will, they will channel two ports of entry because they don't want to miss that shot at asylum. If they do have an ultimate uh, shot at getting asylum, at meeting their criteria, at showing what they need to show, and actually prevailing on their case, then they're likely to say, oh gosh, you know, I don't want to blow my shot at this. I want to present lawfully so that I can still be eligible for this discretionary benefit. That's, uh, that's Does it. Doesn't that argument assume that people whose claims ultimately are going to be denied know they're going to be denied in advance? 
Your Honor, it's, it's People say, well, my claim is going to be granted, so I better go here. Someone says, well, my claim is actually going to be denied. I'll go to this different place. Is that the government's position? Your Honor, I do think the people who actually show up for their — some people logically know that their asylum claims are going to have more merit than others. I mean, so, not all of these claims — you know, a very small number of these claims turn out to show — you know, have merit. It's the people, it seems, who actually show up to their asylum uh, hearings and, and make out the case. It's, it's not the case for everyone. I mean, there's a very small group of people who end up in this group who end up actually getting grants of asylum. And it encourages people to uh, — who, who actually — know they have a strong case for asylum to go and follow the orderly processes to do that. I so think the language — I beg your pardon — I think the language from the Federal Register, and it says this more than once, is that the government is seeking to facilitate the orderly processing at ports of entry that takes into account resource constraints at ports of entry and in U.S. detention facilities. So my question for the government is, how would you describe the state of the record as to whether the ports of entry are either, on the one hand, capable of processing what, by definition, will be an increased flow of asylum applicants, or on the other, whether they are uh, backed up? Or isn't there in the record a statement from uh, the Director of Homeland Security, although it was not put in by the administration, it comes from her, that the government is metering people at the ports of entry? And isn't that inconsistent with the government's uh, stated goal as it's expressed in this interim rule? Your Honor, processing at ports of entry, it does take time. It, you know, there could — there can be delays at various times, and there could be the need to shift additional resources, and the, the rule acknowledges the need to potentially — to, to potentially do that. There will be, you know, a need to see how some of the — some of things — some things work out and where — where additional resources may need to be deployed. But again, I mean, when you have people present at ports of entry, you don't have a situation where you have uh, CBP officers needing to chase people down in ugly conditions and, and that sort of thing. So it, it does make it orderly, and it, presumably the processing could ideally be faster. There could be needs to put more resources towards that. But again, it's it's early in the process of this rule, and that that can be you know, worked out soundly and, and, and in a and in a controlled way. Let's go to a higher level of abstraction and talk about the law for just a second. And this is a point that actually I should have I, I meant to discuss with Mr. Gellern, and maybe I'll do it in his rebuttal argument. What is the burden on the government, if any, for its stated justification to be supported by the record or actually true? Now, you and I are debating right now, or discussing, I think is a better word. We're discussing um, how likely it is that the government could meet its stated goal of facilitating orderly processing of asylum applicants at ports of entry. And we could have the same discussion with regard to the uh, asserted ground that the government wants to negotiate a safe third country agreement with Mexico. I could ask you how likely on the record the government is to actually achieve that goal. But these discussions beg the question of whether the government has an, a legal obligation to, for its asserted justification to be true or for it to be supported by the record. And I don't know and, and it would be useful to me to know what you think that burden, if any, is, and for the plaintiffs to tell me the same thing. Your Honor, maybe on rebuttal I can more crisply articulate how I'd put that in, in, in terms, but I think it would be very light, and whatever it is here in this context where you have uh, matters at the border in which the executive branch exercises great authority and discretion, um, particularly matters that are so well documented in the proposed rule, there are areas of broad authority and discretion. Uh, uh, uh. So well documented? That's my question. The, the, the rule well documents the problem, Your Honor. It's, it, it is a problem that's causing a great strain on our already it's, backlogged. It makes certain assertions. And my question is, to what extent do those assertions need to be supported? To say something is true is not to make it true. Your Honor, I don't think that the plaintiffs in this case have actually gone after the actual factual grounds in any meaningful way on which the rule actually relies. The attacks that they make are, oh, you know, numbers of apprehensions or appearances at the southern border are down overall. This addresses a, a, a more specific I might conclude specific otherwise, problem. and I might conclude otherwise, and I'm giving the government an opportunity to tell me what standard I should apply. I'll, I'll, tr I'll try to have a more, a, a more crisp articulation of that, Your Honor, if, if, I, if I may try to just think about that a little bit. Okay. I appreciate it, Your Honor. Yeah. Thank you.
The numbers in this case show, Your Honor, uh, and as the rule explains, uh, many of this group that transit Mexico and cross unlawfully between ports of entry do not even apply for asylum. Many fail to show up at their hearings, and those who do end up getting asylum in very small numbers because these claims regularly lack merit. Um, this claim, th this strain on our system has compounded a backlog, drawn resources and attention away from other more meritorious claims of the many hundreds of thousands of cases pending, and uniquely strains the immigration system. This, these are kind of the central reasons for this rule. This is what it's targeting, and this is, this is what, it's, what, it's, uh, what it's doing. The rule, the rule is predictive of the things you just said. It says these bad things are going to happen, and so we need to implement this rule. You're using the present tense. Is there anywhere in the record from which I could find support for the notion that the system has, is now currently being overwhelmed by the caravan or, or asylum seekers from what the government calls the Northern Triangle? I mean, the, the numbers you're, it, it, ex, it explains, you know, in, in fair terms, Your Honor, that I'm just looking, this is what I did to Mr. Gellert. I'm just looking for support in the record. Is there record information that I could cite that says, that, su that is supportive of the contention that, as you said a moment ago, um, that the strain on our system has compounded a backlog and drawn resources and attention away from other meritorious claims, et cetera? The, uh, the, the main areas you're, uh, that, Your Honor, are, are on, the, uh, on pages 55,945 to 947. Uh, among other things, those pages catalog that the large numbers of, of, of folks at issue here who are able to enter get possible federal, uh, credible fear screenings. Um, they sap re detention resources, which are limited and often difficult, especially in the case of family units, which have, have been rising uh, above, uh, above pre or have risen at times above previous years, that uh, many, of, many in this, this group are able to um, be released once they have positive federal credible fear determinations and stay in the country for you know months or even years even though they don't have an entitlement to be they ultimately are not found to have uh, a meritorious asylum claim um, this adds to what is already I believe we say the rule says at uh, 946 uh, the 800,000 plus cases uh, pending uh, in the current uh, backlog of section 240 proceedings uh, over a hundred thousand of which um, involve nationals of Northern Triangle countries. So I, those are a few points, Your Honor. It also details the relative lack of merit of a lot of these, the claims that are the target of this particular rule. Um, and I could, I could also add additional details, but I, I, I'd point to those pages uh, in particular and, and the page or so uh, before and after those, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor, you, Moving, moving to um, some more fundamental legal points about here about um, wh why this is a very, very light uh, burden for the executive branch to meet. It's because asylum is, is not a mandatory obligation. It's a discretionary benefit that comes with, you know, comes only uh, with the exer a favorable exercise of discretion after numerous criteria are met. And it's it's something that and, 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 and where are you locating this burden? Is this the government's uh, good cause burden to dispense with notice and comment? Is it a burden that relieves the uh, executive branch of avoiding a conflict, with, a statutory conflict? When you say it's a light burden, which of the claims or defenses are you now addressing? I am uh, I'm addressing the merits of the Immigration and Nationality Act uh, okay. claim. Uh, I, I, can, I can go well, to good no. cause or foreign affairs if you'd if you'd like. No, no, no. I, I, I just want to make sure I'm following the argument. Is the point that if the government meets what you've described as a very light burden, then it can, then, then if I find that there's a conflict between the rule and the proclamation as they operate together and the language of the INA, that I can, uh, that, that I can not be worried about the conflict? Your Honor, I'm not going to concede, concede that there's a conflict, and I would disagree that there's a conflict. I'd like to be able to explain why there is no conflict. You can do that later. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out what, 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 what is it that the, that, that the government doesn't have to... Where, where is the low burden? A low burden to do what? Uh, the low burden to erect uh, 
discretion, discretionary conditions or limitations on eligibility for granting asylum. That's in the statutory language. That's Section 1158B2C. Uh, B, 1158B2A, uh, I believe it is, Your Honor, makes clear that disc asylum is discretionary. It may be granted uh, by the Homeland, by the, the Secretary of Homeland Security or the Attorney General. Uh, and it, it, bars to eligibility can in turn be erected so long as they're consistent with Section 1158, the statute. Uh, Section 1158 erects very few barriers. What it, what it does erect barriers on is, in many cases, the granting of asylum. The, the Attorney General or the Secretary cannot grant asylum to certain categories of uh, offenders uh, and, and other types of, of people who um, fit, ca uh, fit different categories. In addition, there is a lot of discretion to uh, erect additional bars so long as they're consistent. There's nothing inconsistent by erecting a bar for someone who does not just enter but enters in a particularly problematic manner as determined by a presidential proclamation. And th that's a point I think of, I'd like to emphasize, Your Honor. The government makes a distinction between, co between Congress saying that you can apply for asylum regardless of uh, whether you came in at a port of entry. You'd think after the, the uh, amount of uh, preparation for this hearing I could actually say the statutory language, but it's escaping me. I'm sorry. I know you know what I mean. Yes, Your Honor. Um, and, and then the President and the Attorney General saying, well, they can say that, but we can deny asylum on the same ground. Doesn't the second thing render the first thing a nullity? I mean, I'll give you an example. Let's say we said, um, we, we had a, a congressional statute that said, you can come to the hearing at the federal courthouse um, in any vehicle. You are, uh, you're, allowed to, you're, allowed to, uh, you're allowed to ask to come into the courthouse if you come in any vehicle. But then we, we have a, a, a rule that someone passes that says, I'll tell you what, you can ask, but if you came here on a bicycle, you're not coming in. You're not. What's the point of, of, of saying that the vehicle that you used to get here doesn't matter? How does it not render, I'm not doing as elegant a job with this as I'd like, but how does it not render the congressional, uh, the expression of congressional intent a, a nullity? It would be as if you, as if you were to say, you can come and enter the courthouse so long as you do so consistent with the remainder of what I'm about to, you know, the conditions I lay out. So too here, Your Honor, with Section 1158A1, it says that as a general rule, it, it's captioned in general, an alien who is physically present in the United States may, dot, 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 may apply for asylum in accordance with this section. So that means in accordance with other provisions of 1158. Those include, for example, the immediately following exceptions for even being eligible to apply for asylum. So yes, there is a broad general rule under 1158A1, Your Honor, to be able to apply for asylum, but that's immediately qualified by several exceptions just for applying. In and general is a title. It's not part of the paragraph. So to the extent that you're suggesting that Congress meant to draw a distinction, I don't know that the argument is supported by the statute. What the statute says, and I now have it in front of me and I wished I had a moment ago, any alien who is physically present in the United States or who arrives in the United States, whether or not at a designated port of arrival, et cetera, may apply for asylum. What's left of that? I guess that's, the, that's a better way of asking the question. If this rule is valid, what's left of that expression of, of congressional intent? Your Honor, you didn't mention the last several words that follow that, which says, may apply for asylum in accordance with this section. 1158 proceeds to make that general rule subject to a fair number of qualifications, exceptions, establishment, eligibility. It absolutely or, does. Yes. None of them have to do with port of entry. Your Honor, it's not inconsistent with that. Well, first of all, Your Honor, what I would say there is that it would render meaningless that under that under that view it would be you know anybody can apply for asylum who falls with under the, the six statutory bars but they would still never be able to get asylum um, and you know still that you know there's no argument here that that somehow guts 1158a1 I mean it's still a general rule that you may apply but then at the eligibility stage other qualifiers and other factor comes factors come in and one of those qualifiers your honor is 1158 
B2C, which says the Attorney General by regulation may by regulation establish additional limits and condi uh, conditions consistent with this section under which an alien shall be eligible for asylum under paragraph one. And that's what he's done here, Your Honor. And if I can emphasize the Well, it has to be point. consistent with the section. Right. I mean, it, it, it would be, we don't have a situation where Congress said in subsection one, hey, even if you've been convicted of a felony, you know, reg regardless, regardless of whether you've ever been convicted of a felony, you can come in. They put that down below. They said if you've been convicted of a felony, you're not eligible. Uh, there's nowhere, I guess my point is, I, the difficulty I have with the, with the government's argument is that there's nowhere else later in this, yes, yes, there are exceptions, but none of them have anything to do with this explicit carve out in A1. But I'll, I'll move on because now I feel as though I'm, I'm, I'm perhaps debating this with you more than asking you. Uh, do, uh, let, me, let me turn to something else. Can and I add one little point on that, Your Honor? Sure. I don't, I don't want to. No, no, please. Um, the point I'd add, Your Honor, is that I, I think it's undisputed and under matter of Pula, the, the BIA's decision, it's clear that manner of entry can be relevant and therefore is certainly dispositive of asylum eligibility in some cases. There's no, di there's no distinction that can be drawn with that, no principal distinction that can be drawn with that, and making manner of entry in a particular subset of cases a categorical bar. And here, Your Honor, the point I want to just emphasize is that- Well, I, let's talk about that for a second. Um, doesn't, doesn't overwhelming authority say that while manner of entry can be considered, it is to be given very little weight? And so is, well, my question would be first, is there any authority for the proposition that it could be given dispositive weight? And um, I, I guess that's the question. I don't actually, I don't, I, don't, I don't have a second question. If I did, it would be, wouldn't that nonetheless bring whatever court said that, if one ever did, into conflict with the explicit language of the statute? But I, I don't think there is a court that's ever said that. No, Your Honor, it's the idea that you can bar subsets of people based on manner of entry. There, there's not any sort of overwhelming authority of that. The Pula decision recognized it can be a factor. It, it did that as a general matter in individualized cases. There's nothing in the statute that prevents the Attorney General and the Secretary in their broad discretion to categorically bar that. And I, if I can emphasize, this is the point I want to emphasize, Your Honor, is that this rule accompanied with the proclamation do not make aliens ineligible for asylum based merely on illegal entry. It's not an illegal entry per se. Rather, it makes them ineligible for asylum on a separate and additional basis. That not just that they illegally entered, but that they contravened, contravened a particular presidential proclamation suspending or limiting, en limiting entry based on the president's particularized foreign policy laden determination that, that that entry would be detrimental to the national interest. So it's a heightened, different in kind sort of entry. It's not manner of entry per se. It's different, and it warrants the ineligibility bar imposed. What, here. Is the, what does the presidential proclamation add? Um, well, one illegal manner of entry. It, I mean, for one thing, it, it points out that this is a this violation of law is particular uh, implicates the national interest in a particular way. Uh, two, it it notes and tries to in encourage potential interdiction efforts to prevent this, you know, this problem and kind of facilitate relations with Mexico. Um, and again, it puts the president's backing in his pursuant to his own broad authority under 1182F and 1185A to you know, find that this is a serious issue and it needs to be addressed. I, I think because uh, the plaintiffs have stated that they're not challenging the proclamation independently, probably I don't reach the issue uh, because uh, there's no longer a controversy before the court. But, um, but because that wasn't clear when I took the bench, let me ask uh, you the same question I asked your opponent, and that is, uh, in the absence of the rule, does the proclamation have independent legal effect? Um, it, it, it does, Your Honor, especially with, uh, with respect to the potential interdiction discussions and efforts. Um, it does embody a, you know, a, a particularized determination. What I would say, Your Honor, is that I don't, the, procula the proclamation is what triggers the ineligibility bar under the rule. So, I mean, there's really no basis to, I mean, invalidating the rule doesn't make a lot of sense. It should be, if anything, 
saying that there's a pro issue with a proclamation such that a, you know, another proclamation could be issued potentially. Um, but I, I would say the, the proclamation does add, but there is a lot of the two working in tandem here, Your Honor. Um, um, the, the ports of entry, the, out, the ability to seek asylum through ports of entry is contained in the proclamation, but not the rule, right? Um, I, I believe that's right, Your Honor. I mean, it, it, it is what's expressly addressed, but they, they kind of you know, interlock. So is it also correct that there is no check in the rule itself on the President's ability to deny asylum to anyone who enters at the southern border, irregardless of where they enter? Your Honor, I don't know what that argument means by the plaintiffs. There's nothing in the, in the proclamation that purports to deny asylum to anyone. It, you know, it, suspends, it suspends and limits entry, and there is an effect of, you know, when it, it doesn't get into the issue of like, oh, could the, could the I, President himself I, I think that? the argument goes to the question of how much authority the interim rule purports to confer on the President. Anyway, I, 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 I don't have a more specific question for you. It's really the, the departments exercising their authority, Your Honor, uh, on to, uh, under Title VIII, um, and doing so um, based in part on a presidential determination that the president is himself expressly statutorily authorized to make. Your Honor, if I could turn maybe to some of the, the APA uh, procedural issues. Sure. Um, and I want to hopefully save some, some, some a decent amount of time for rebuttal. But just really quickly, Your Honor, um, yes, I'm, thank you. Um, first, Your Honor, on the issue of good cause, the, the declarations and the plaintiff's briefing do not get to the key good cause argument that the, that the preamble of this rule advances. That good cause argument is not, you know, oh, just everyday continuation of normal migration patterns. Rather, the concern is that Announcing an ineligibility rule, uh, but not giving it immediate effect, would lead to a surge in in uh, dangerous and unlawful border crossings in order to evade this asylum ineligibility uh, bar. That is logical. It makes sense when we have a situation where I believe about a thousand uh, folks are entering unlawfully between ports of entry at the southern border. That means, you know, on average, every day you have you know another thousand who are within range by plaintiff's own declarations, it's, it's pretty clear that the communication streams to, whether it be to caravans or, or others who are, or are transiting toward the southern border, hear about these things. And it's really the risk of a, a surge and all of the resource uh, difficulties and the dangers to, to both um, life and safety on both sides of the border that that occasions. On foreign affairs, Your Honor, the plaintiffs and their declarants also ignore, give short shrift to the key foreign affairs here. We're not just saying, Your Honor, that, oh, because this involves immigration, it therefore automatically meets the foreign affairs exception. What's really trying to go, you know, be facilitated here, Your Honor, are negotiations with uh, Mexico and with the northern triangle countries to deal with this difficult problem of, you know, each country taking responsibility for I its own nationals, for providing asylum and, and that sort of thing. In Doe versus Trump. Uh, my colleague, Judge Robart in Washington, rejected the assertion of the foreign affairs exception on the ground that the government had not provided any evidence to support the assertion. So this is similar to the question that I asked you before about a different aspect of the government's argument. But it's, and the question is, what obligation, if any, is there on the government to support an assertion of the foreign affairs document, uh, doctrine? And if you say none, then that's your argument, and then you, can, you don't have to say anything more. And if you say it's anything other than none, the question is how likely do you think it is that the United States will be able to negotiate a safe third party a country agreement with Mexico? Um, and, we, and what basis is there for thinking that it's likely? We don't need to, we don't need to establish any definite likelihood that it will be established, Your Honor. Uh, is saying it sufficient? Your Honor, I'm not sure if saying it would be sufficient, but it's not what the issue is here. It says uh, we are. Um, it is if I ask. I'm asking you about it. It's the issue here. Your Honor, the the rule explains that we are in diplomatic discussions with Mexico and the other countries to try to deal with this problem, and we can't guarantee that the, that will bear uh, 
a fruitful agreement that that will resolve all issues. But we're, we're you know, we're trying. We're hopeful. Uh, and, can and you frankly, please can you please explain the relationship between denying asylum to those who do not enter at a designated port of entry and the likelihood that negotiations with Mexico to uh, achieve a safe third party country agreement will go up? Sure, Your Honor. I think it goes beyond the safe third country agreement, but if I can give you my kind of foreign affairs pitch here, it's simply that Mexico has a responsibility for the people transiting its country and for its border with the United States. One aspect of that responsibility is not to turn a blind eye to people who transit uh, through their country and then break United States law by entering. By closing the border, between ports of entry and requiring channeling to those ports of entry, the executive branch has here recognized the importance of these you know, principles, these obligations as well, and it is signaled to Mexico, look, these are important to us. They can't, you can't just have this happening. You need to work with us to find a more comprehensive solution that may be, that hopefully will be a safe third country agreement. It will, you know, in all events, hopefully produce something, uh, you know, fruitful that helps address this, this shared problem that by uh, plaintiff's own declarations, you know, is, is, is one that is, is, uh, is significant and, and is worth addressing. Uh, you know, it's an international negotiation. We can't guarantee a result, but it is intimately tied with the President's foreign affairs agenda and his effort to do this. Uh, if I may, Your Honor, can I, if, if there's nothing immediate, can I save the rest of my sure. time for, for you may. Rebuttal. You may. Thank you for being so responsive to the court's questions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, court will be in recess for 15 minutes. Thank you. All rise. Remain seated. Come to order. Court is now in session. All right, let's go back on the record, Mr. Gillard. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> If I could start by answering some of your questions about the record. Um, in the proclamation, in the, in the rule itself, the preamble, at 55935, it shows that 6,000 people um, who EWED, who entered, sorry, entered without inspection, received asylum, and 74,000 passed their CFI, the credible fear initial screening. So those are the numbers that I think we're looking at with this rule in, in one year. Um, I know Your Honor had asked about burdens, and I, I want to um, just mention a couple of cases that I think are relevant to the government's burden. Um, one is on the good cause. I think the D.C. Circuit in the Sorensen case, which we cite, lays out pretty clearly what the good cause inquiry is about and what the government's burden is. And talks about how it needs to be meticulous and demanding. It's narrowly construed. Um, it's, it's an extremely demanding burden. So I think the Sorensen case is, is what we would cite for that. On the foreign affairs exception, I think the Ninth Circuit has a particularly demanding standard. And I would cite the court to the Yassini case that from the Ninth Circuit about the Iran hostage crisis. I love Yassini because both sides love that case. <laughs> Every now and then you get that. I mean, it's like, yeah. anyway. <laughs> so we would, well, for our part, we would cite footnote. You like footnote four. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I don't need to tell your I honor read the about case. it then. Um, I would, um, on the burden on the INA claim, I, it, I wasn't sure exactly what the government was saying its burden was, but what we would answer it this way is that where Congress has addressed the precise issue, no amount of evidence the executive branch can put in would allow it to override Congress. Congress has made the judgment. They've put it in the statute. I don't hear the government to say that the Attorney General can override Congress if it has, if the Attorney General had enough evidence. It's a fight about what the statute means. And I, I think your, your Honor has pinpointed um, what we believe are the holes in the government's argument about the express language being inconsistent with their role. Let me ask you a standing question, and I, I think Mr. Stewart probably wanted to uh, uh, hammer away a little bit at the government's standing argument, but I had a lot of questions for him, so perhaps we'll hear that more of that <clears throat> on rebuttal. But my question for you is, is there any way for uh, 
asylum seekers who enter between designated ports of entry, whom I'll just call third-party plaintiffs for the p purposes of our discussion, <clears throat> is there any way for them to challenge the interim final rule in their immigration proceedings? Your Honor, as I understand it, I think the government may say that there's limited judicial review when you're putting in an expedited removal case, which is what's going to happen, expedited removal proceeding, which is those summary proceedings at the border. My understanding from past cases, and I think from, from this case as well. well I, think after, I think after the IJ level, there's no judicial review, and I think it says that. Uh, that's the government's in, position. Yes, either in the rule, no, I think that sentence is in there, either in the interim rule or the proclamation. I'd have to go back. But. Yeah, and just, just to be fair, to put the court on notice, we are challenging that, saying there has to be judicial review unrelated to this rule. That's a case that's goes, that's an issue that goes way back. But as at the moment, Your Honor, that is the law of the land, that there's no review of expedited removal. Okay, so let's, let's, let's just assume <clears throat> that what happens is if the rule goes into effect, that uh, an, an alien or an immigrant is apprehended having crossed at other than a designated port of entry and uh, pursuant to the rule is deemed not to have a credible fear and uh, placed into, you know, and also given a, given a reasonable fear interview um, and uh, if not found not to meet that standard, placed into expedited uh, removal. Anywhere in there, it, would that person have the opportunity to challenge this interim final rule? The government's position is no, they would not. So they would be removed. And so I think that's what we're looking at is individuals now being removed without even a chance to challenge the rule. And I think, you know, the government may take issue with jurisdictional positions. I don't know what they're going to say about jurisdiction generally is that there's no jurisdiction over that. But you certainly could issue a TRR preliminary injunction and reserve that question if, but, w but right now, Your Honor is exactly right. That is the government's position. They're going to get that expedited removal, and the government is going to say you can't apply for asylum and based on the rule, and then you're going to be removed. And that's what we're seeing now in the last few days. If this case were not present, in other words, if this case had not been filed and we were not having our discussion, could that individual uh, asylum seeker file a habeas case in the federal district court? If they couldn't get relief directly in the immigration? The government's position is no. And so that's why I think we are here seeking a uh, TRA. And, and on, I just want to um, raise one question, I mean, sorry, raise one point that you brought up about third party standing. What we have learned in the last 48 hours um, is that there's an acute problem on the borders in Mexico where the Mexican government is not letting unaccompanied children get on the waiting list, even though the list is so long and they're in danger, but they're not even allowed to be on the list. And so one of our plaintiffs, AOL, is going to represent them, but I think in order for them to challenge, they couldn't even get into the country because they're not allowed on a port of entry, they're not allowed to apply at a port of entry. So. We believe in addition to all the other standing arguments in zone of interest, which we believe we satisfy, that there is third party standing, and that's classic third party standing, where these children are in Mexico, will not even be in those expedited removal proceedings, even if there were habeas, they wouldn't be able to access even the IJ proceedings, the AO, um, the AO and the asylum officer and IJ proceedings. So I think that's why we believe there's a critical need. There's just too many people now in danger. Those kids are in desperate danger on the Mexican side. Um, and, and I, you know, again, that goes back to some of Your Honor's points about putting this in place so quickly before there's even a system to handle people at ports. That's even assuming that ultimately this rule would channel people. Um, the, the, other, the other point I would make is that I, I think Your Honor pulled out the exact phrase in the promulgation, the, the preamble, that's critical to understanding the disconnect between the rule and what they're trying to do. And that's where they say, we're talking about writ large, the asylum process. I mean, that really seems to be what's going on, is they don't like the asylum process. That's fine. The administration can have that battle with Congress. But ultimately, I think as the government concedes, the proclamation is not what's denying asylum. The Attorney General can have that fight with Congress, but there's really no connection between the rule and the problems they see in the asylum process. Now, we believe the asylum process is working. Congress made it clear that they wanted a low threshold at the border in these summary hearings because someone is 
traumatized, they don't have counsel, they're not going to understand how to present their claim, and so Congress wanted a low threshold in that first hearing. But ultimately, this is more a fight between, I think, the executive branch and Congress. Congress has made a decision. Congress can alter it. But right now, Congress has been very clear that people who enter between ports are allowed to apply. And I think saying that they can apply but not eligible, I think I'm not sure I could add anything to what Your Honor said about that would render it a nullity. Um, unless there are further questions, Your Honor, I, I think I would um, sit down then. Thanks. I don't have any okay, thank more you, questions. Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, a few points, Your Honor, that I that I just want to want to hit home before I sit down. Um, one is that one of the strange things about this suit was that it was brought, it was filed the very day that this regulation out came out before the rule and proclamation had actually been applied to anyone, and so we have this odd situation where we have. Uh, organizations that are alleging speculative harms that may not come to pass you know they haven't waited to see how the actual rule will play out they're you know they're not they're asserting that they're go going to be injured in certain ways and we don't really have the situation of somebody filing suit uh, in a, the concrete context of having the rule applied to them those suits would need, you know to the extent there was would be a systemic challenge to those those folks that the, the exclusive venue for those would be in the District of Columbia Federal Court, where the challenges to the validity of, of you know, the expedited removal system could be processed. Do you um, disagree, by the way, with Mr. Gellert that an individual uh, asylum applicant who were apprehended after, who, excuse me, who was apprehended after crossing between designated ports of entry would not have an opportunity to challenge the interim final rule in, in, at any point in the immigration proceedings, or Mr. Gellert would say otherwise? Well, he actually, he said it was your position. He didn't tell me what his position was. But that's what he said your position would be. Is he right? No, Your Honor. I, I think the right challenge for that would, again, it would be in the district of, it would be in DDC. That's where a systemic challenge, um, so, you know, by judicial review by somebody who's ex subject to um, an, ex an expedited removal determination, that's where those venues lie, just given the need for national uniformity. Um, but you actually need a person who's been subjected to the system. So that would be the way to, to challenge that. There's also Would that halt the person's expedited removal? Um, it would, I mean, it would depend on what the court would say there, Your Honor. I mean, I, I don't, I won't concede that the court could proper, could properly do that, but I would add that the court. The so court could do it improperly? I mean, I'm not trying to argue with you, but I just, I'm just trying to figure out who, this is what standing is about. Who has the right to stand up in court for these people? Who lets them do that? So does the government, let's put aside what Mr. Gellert would say if he were arguing the case in the District of the District of Columbia, okay? What would you say? You're at the podium, and the district court says to you, is this person, hey, they just filed this lawsuit, the person's in expedited removal. Are you gonna stop the expedited removal? What would the government's position be? I'm not going to commit to a position on this at that time, Your Honor, in part because I would need to see what the situation is of the person challenging the expedited removal. Again, as we've emphasized, this is a premature suit, but it is a challenge to the expedited removal system is venued in DDC. This court doesn't have authority to touch that system, and, and the District of Columbia is authorized and directed by the statute to proceed very quickly in, in dealing with those kinds of suits. Um, it, it, is the, it is the place where these suits have, has hap have happened before. One, one attempted such suit was filed not that long ago, a couple of months ago, I, I want to say. Um, that court, the D.C. Circuit and the D.D.C. have spoken authoritatively, it's authoritatively to this question and pointed out the problems of organizations trying to, to seek relief on behalf of people because what that really is is somebody, you need people who are subject to this determination and, and the D.D.C. can properly uh, address those things. On the issue of relief, Your Honor, you asked Mr. Gallant, Your Honor asked Mr. Gallant, earlier what the, the nature of any relief would be. I would emphasize that the plaintiffs are asking for extraordinarily, extraordinary emergency relief, halting in its tracks an important executive branch policy uh, based on abstract, remote, self-inflicted theories of injury. And any relief that this court could provide would have to be sharply limited to their particular circumstances. At most, it would have to apply to the plaintiffs themselves and people who are demonstrably their clients and are, you know, would be 
supposedly connected to the harm that they that they allege. They make these organizations the most popular law firms at the border. If I did that, wouldn't I? Uh, it would. It's, it's the rule. Um, the, this rule doesn't apply to you or your clients, but it applies to every other law firm that might be trying to help asylum seekers. How's that going to work? I'm not recommending the. I'm recommending denying the TRO, Your Honor. That, that's our position. But no, I'm I get that, that, but I'm just. I, this is a manageability question. But you're saying if you don't deny it, I should just apply the relief to them, and I'm just wondering how that would actually work in practical effect. I mean, I think anybody who, I, again, it's very hard here, Your Honor, because we have a situation where we have uh, speculative theories of harm where we don't know how these, this asylum application, we don't have confirmation that this asylum application situation is going to play out the way hypothesized by the plaintiff organizations. Well, let me ask you the same case management point that I asked Mr. Gellin, and that is, let's say I do issue a temporary restraining order, then what? Do you anticipate that there would be further proceedings? Would there be another hearing with regard to a preliminary injunction? Would the parties take discovery from each other? What do you think should happen if I do issue a TRO? This would be an administrative record case, Your Honor. The court should, uh, if the court were to grant a TRO in any sort of, uh, in any sort of respect, it should, it should have, administrative record and preliminary injunction briefing as expeditiously as possible to get this matter resolved. It's, it's a very important initiative. It's How quickly is the government prepared to produce the administrative record? Um, I could check on that, Your Honor, but I mean, it could be, you know, I, I'm, you know, I... Everyone's acting like they're surprised that this might lead to a preliminary injunction hearing. But anyway, okay, so we'll take that under advisement. Right, Your Honor. We, we, we'd be, you know, we'd be prepared to, you know, move in a matter of days, you know, expeditiously. It's, it's, it's difficult to, for me to stand here and say, you know, a, few, a couple of days, you know, fair enough, a truncated week, what the day would be. Um, but we'd, we'd want to move very expeditiously if, if that were the direction things were headed in. All right. Uh, Your Honor, I'd emphasize you asked earlier about the burden on these factual assertions. I, I think Mr. Glenn actually somewhat, somewhat hit on this when he emphasized that the nature of his challenge is a legal one. What I would say is that. Uh, to the extent there is some challenge on the, the accuracy of the government's assessments or predictions, that would be an arbitrary and capricious type challenge, I, I believe. Uh, that challenge, that kind of challenge has not been brought and it would need to await the production of the administrative record in, in any event, but it's it just not at issue in this hearing. And I think Mr. Clarence in effect said that when he said that the nature of his challenge is really legal. Uh, Zone of interest, Your Honor, just briefly. Um, you know, we hit this in our briefing. Um, it somewhat gets to some of the standing issues too, but which I, which I've also hit. But the zone of interest here, the people who would really be affected by this rule are, you know, the aliens themselves. The immigration laws are really aimed at the interests of, of aliens. Um, there, you know, will presumably be aliens who fall within the zone of interest in these statutes, but. Organizations who are trying to, uh, who fall in this category, just do not fit within the aims of the immigration laws in the same way. Uh, I'd also add that challenges to, to expedited, or to, uh, you see other indicators in, in the statute of that. Expedited removal cha challenges are channeled to DC, to DC as I've said. Um, challenges to removal often take an individualized form, and there's just not this kind of you know, broad organizational theory for this subset of of uh, cases, and I also, on just standing more generally, Your Honor, I haven't seen any limiting principle to the, that the plaintiffs had offered to the Havens Realty point uh, about just, if they were allowed standing here, then any organization that uh, kind of has its mission in the area of, of law that changed could claim standing because it would, you know, affect what, you know, affect their mission and they could choose to divert resources in response to it. Uh, Another point, Your Honor, I don't think that, that you um, mentioned this much, but this was a big theme, at least in the, in the briefing. I don't, I, I don't know if this has been mentioned, except by Mr. Glenn earlier today, is I want to emphasize that a theme in the ACLU's briefing has been, ACLU and colleagues' briefing, has been that this rule effectively returns people to their persecutors and torturers. I want to emphasize it does no such thing. Asylum is a discretionary benefit. The key protections for avoiding return to a country where somebody is going to be persecuted or, or tortured or statutory withholding and removal and protection under the regulation implementing the regulations uh, implementing the Convention Against Torture. 
persons who are suffering from torture don't also make asylum claims sometimes? Um, some do, Your Honor. Some do. But again, asylum is a discretionary benefit. And the well, availability of, of torture claims still is there in full force. It's discretionary, but it has a lower bar. It has a lower bar for the, uh, the showing of demonstrating refugee status, Your Honor. But there are also, uh, not to change uses of the words bars, other prohibitions on it. And it also requires an ultimate favorable exercise of discretion. Again, it comes with a lot of benefits, Your Honor. But the, well, the discretion is reviewable. It's easier to get, but it's discretionary. And so the effect of this would be that there might be some persons. I mean, I, my question is, isn't it true? that the effect of this would be that there might be some persons who are subject to torture, who might, uh, who might qualify for these other forms of relief. But because, in the view of the authorities, they are not able to meet the, what would now be the higher bar of the mandatory forms of relief, they don't get relief. And it's not because they are not entitled to it under any circumstances. It's that they are not entitled to it under the form of relief that has a lower bar. Isn't that what would happen? Your Honor, I think it's a shift. It's, it's a different way of exercising discretion over an already discretionary benefit. And when you have a large system, you know, you, you work with the system as, as perfectly as you can, you know, to hammer things out in individual cases. But it meets the United States' obligation, and it properly allows people who are claiming some kind of persecution or fear that's cognizable, uh, cognizable under the law to make those claims. The plaintiffs repeatedly insist that you know, a great many of the people who, whose interests they're claiming to look after have very strong claims uh, about torture and persecution. They can still bring those claims. The problem that we're going after with this rule. Does the government contend that none of them that would have been granted in the past will now be denied? That I, is a yes or no question. I, I don't think we, you know, granted what, Your Honor? Does the government contend? Your, your argument, I take your argument to be, look, the plaintiffs can still bring these claims. What's the problem? And my question for you is, does the government contend that some claims for relief, that, that no claims for relief that would have been granted in the past will now be denied? I can't, I can't predict what, what will happen, Your Honor. I mean, I, you know, it's just nothing, nothing changes as far as the avail availability of withholding of removal or convention under the Protection Against Torture. Those remain unaffected. It's just the discretionary benefit of asylum, uh, which is, brings with it a lot of other additional direct and collateral benefits, is, is what's affected here. And it's affected in response to uh, a major, major crisis. And I'd add that many people subject to asylum bars could similarly have um, claims, claims of, of, of you know, persecution, for example, that they're now, despite those claims, ineligible to get because, say, they fall under one of the six statutory bars. So there are circumstances in which people uh, you know, otherwise eligible for asylum have been barred from asylum as a categorical matter. This, given uh, the broad statutory authority and the broad discretion in the executive branch, falls uh, comfortably within the legal authorization to do that. You have one minute remaining. Thank you. Let's see if I have. I just emphasize the, uh, as I've said, Your Honor, and in, in rebuttal, that to the extent any relief were granted, you know, it should be very limited, very carefully tailored, and very sensitive to the extraordinary executive branch interest at this case in uh, addressing a serious crisis in our asylum system. Um, and, but in addition to that, I would, as I've explained, ask the court to deny the TRO and uh, allow the rule and proclamation co to continue their effect. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Stewart, thank you. Gentlemen, thank you both for your arguments. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you both for your briefing. This motion is now under submission and court is now in recess.